everybody, and welcome to uh, OSU Extension Agronomic Props Team's first ever virtual corn college and soybean school. I'm Mary Griffith, an Extension Educator in Madison County, Ohio, and I'm one of the Agronomic Crops team leaders along with Amanda Doritas and Laura Lindsay, and the three of us will be mo uh, moder moderating throughout uh, the day. So thank you for joining us. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I know it's a little bit different here since um, I, I can't see a line forming behind for in the lunch line because we're all eating lunch at home. So maybe I'll be a little bit uh, less concerned about making sure we all get all, uh, get my presentation finished uh, before lunch. So I am uh, Dr. Andy Michael, uh, State Extension Specialist for uh, corn, and I'm going to be covering corn insect management today. Uh, let me see, make sure this works. So for today's talk, um, I'll focus on below ground pests of corn, specifically looking at uh, grubs and rootworms, and then discussing some above ground issues that we've been seeing, somewhat piggybacking on Pierce's presentation about ear rots, because there is a relationship between caterpillar feeding and uh, ear rots. Also looking at uh, emerging cases, increasing cases of BT resistance. And then hopefully there's time, uh, the EPA uh, released a proposal to changes on uh, insect resistant management and how to define and uh, manage the risk associated with BT resistance in caterpillars. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what the proposal, some of the main points, main ideas behind this proposal and what this proposal means for Ohio. Uh, and it's important to note, especially now, in case I forget later on, that this is just a proposal. These are not um, actions that the EPA is necessarily going to take. Uh, uh, we provided comments as land grant extension entomologists. I know the companies have provided comments, other people have provided comments. Um, and so the decision, what is gonna happen is still up in the air. Um, so, um, let us continue on talking about below ground. Uh, let's talk about Western corn rootworm. I still think this is the most significant uh, root pest, insect pest um, in corn in Ohio, uh, mainly just because of the geographical area that it covers, which is about most of the Western half of Ohio. I-71 seems to be the good dividing line. If you're west of I-71, you're more than likely to encounter greater rootworm problems than you are if you're east. That's not to say that if you're east of I-71, you will not see rootworms because you will. It's just a matter of managing risk and we see higher populations in Western Ohio. We usually only see this as a problem uh, in corn after corn. Uh, this is because as the adults emerge from the corn fields, they mate relatively quickly as they emerge uh, and the females uh, oviposit eggs, fertilized eggs uh, right away. Um, and typically this is in that corn field. So if that corn field is planted to corn the following year, when those eggs hatch, they will have corn roots ready to go. This is why corn after corn, second year corn, third year corn are all more vulnerable to corn rootworm damage. And this is why we recommend rotating your fields after corn is planted uh, to prevent against rootworm damage. Um, there isn't really any much uh, impact of on tillage versus no-till. Really the most deciding factor is whether you have corn after corn in, whether in, in managing the risk from rootworms. So how do you control them? Again, rotate crops. This is the easiest and by far the best way to manage against rootworms. There are seed treatments, um, but these seed treatments, I, we would recommend using the high rate of seed treatments. And this really only applies in low pressure situations. If you're doing corn after corn and you only have a seed treatment on there, more than likely that's not gonna hold up because of the high pressure and the amount of feeding that you get. If you're in a low risk situation, you might be able to get by with just a seed treatment as long as you use the high rate. Of course, there's always still insecticides too that are really still uh, good and effective against uh, corn rootworm larvae. Well, what about BT, the transgenic corn, uh, the traded corn for rootworms below ground? We have seen problems out in Western Corn Belt 
for resistance to BT. Uh, first started in Iowa and now it's pretty much widespread across the Western Corn Belt. This is a table from Joe Spencer and Nick Cedar at uh, the Illinois Natural, His Natural History Survey and the University of Illinois. And what you can see here is this is the BT trait, CRY3BB1, um, that's expressed in in a suspected resistant field, this is where they've gone and they've done the root digs, they've seen damage by rootworms, um, and they've taken um, uh, adults from that and reared that field and reared them, you're getting about 40% survival on a corn that's expressing a trait that should control rootworms. The same here with modified CRY3A, you're getting about 43%, 44% survival. That's not what we expect, especially when we spend you know, uh, expensive tra uh, tech, tech fees for these bags of, of traded corn. The CRY3435 AB seems to be doing a little bit better. You're getting nine to 10% survival on this trait, but this is in Illinois and we know that the situation is worse than Iowa for this trait too. Most of these traits are now ineffective, or at least we're seeing high resistance in these streets in the, in the Western Corn Belt. As far as I know, and as far as we know, this is not occurring in Ohio yet. Well, one of the nice things about Ohio is that we have typically lower rootworm populations. Um, so we have not seen any evidence of resistance just yet. That doesn't mean it's not out there. That doesn't mean we're in a high risk situation, especially if we're doing corn after corn. That just means that we need to really monitor the situation to make sure that we don't have a resistance issue and we never get a resistance issue. Um, how we do this is to make sure we scout continuous corn. Uh, and this includes doing some root digs to make sure that uh, we uh, see the protection that we expect to see. A lot of times this damage can go unnoticed. Um, even if you're above a, a, a threshold of rootworm damage, sometimes you don't see corn being knocked over. Sometimes you don't see the goosenecking, which is the typical symptoms of rootworm damage. A lot of this can go missed. So if you're doing continuous corn, uh, I would really strongly recommend that you do some root digs to make sure that you're not getting any feeding on there. Otherwise, it could be a, a, a symptom that we miss and we could be kind of hitting or hiding the resistant, uh, uh, resistant frequency in Ohio. There is a new uh, trait coming soon. This is RNAi or RNA interference. Uh, I don't have time to really go into the methodology, but in brief, this is just a way that um, shuts down the expression of certain genes in rootworm beetles, which is pretty neat and pretty cool. Uh, and this is a, maybe a, an interesting technology for the future. Uh, and this is labeled as Smart Stacks Pro. It's in limited acreage, I think this year, mainly for the Western Corn Belt where they're having so much issues against BT uh, resistance, but this is something to look uh, to the future. We're more than likely going to see more and more releases of RNA interference based. Uh, if some of you are following the COVID vaccines, it's almost a very similar uh, mechanism where you're looking at RNA and, and targeting the RNA. So this is really interesting, something to look for on the horizon. Another significant pest that we see for corn in below ground is Asiatic garden beetle. We're seeing continuing issues most often in Northwest Ohio, especially in sandy soils. Uh, this is an early season grub of corn, usually in the V1 to V4, but V1, V2 is usually the most vulnerable stage. This is the grub here. This is just a typical white grub um, that you see. You can see it's a little bit bigger. Uh, and more like a, an apostrophe or comma shape here. But these are the Asiatic garden beetles. They're a little bit smaller, almost a C shape, and they have this kind of white pocket, white, white bubble here near its mouth part. Um, here's an example of some scouting that we've done up in Fulton County. And you can see here the sandy soil. You can see here the gaps in the row that are really indicative of a grub issue. And here's one grub that we've pulled up on the soil. When I move my hand, you can see that I've picked this corn plant here, which is really stunted compared to the rest of the corn. Uh, and just by digging around the soil with a hand trowel very gently, you can start to see and find these Asiatic garden beetles. I think this video was taking, taken in maybe the second week of June. And normally by the second week or third week of June, we start to see pupation. So these grubs are a little lethargic, although you can see them moving around. They're very uh, sensitive to light. And once they're exposed to the light, they move really, really fast. Um, so some uh, most of the other grub species are just kind of more like couch potatoes. But the Asiatic garden beetles are really fast. You can see here, I'm up to five grubs in the span of a minute. And by just doing a little bit more digging, I find 
a six scrub. So six scrubs per one corn plant, it's going to be a, a really significant problem. Notice also how sandy the so soil is. That's a really key characteristic or risk uh, factor of Asiatic garden beetles. Um, and so we see them more, more likely in the present in sandier soils. This is a picture um, from Michigan State University. You can see here the damage here, uh, all caused a poor emergence by Asiatic garden beetle. And this is a field with heavy sandy soils. So it could be a very significant problem in certain areas. We're getting some better ideas and better research on how to handle and how to manage Asiatic garden beetles. One thing to not try is a low to moderate rate of seed treatment. That's not gonna work. I have seen, or we have seen some success with high rates um, um, uh, of seed treatment, but if you have a high pressure situation, if you're in a sandy soil and you have a history of Asiatic garden beetles, even the high rates sometimes have difficulty in protecting against Asiatic garden beetle damage. Most inferral products at the labeled rates sometimes are not going to cut it. Um, tillage is not going to cut it either. You will only see minor suppression in, in tilled fields. We're still working on whether or not spraying soybeans at R3 is an effective tactic. The reason why you might spray a soybean field is to uh, reduce the adult population and reduce the overposition, the egg laying by the adults in that soybean field, if that soybean field will be rotated to corn the following year. The key or the idea behind this is that you're killing the adults so that the eggs are not laid. This is really difficult because one, you're somewhat maybe wasting a spray on soybean at R3, especially if there are no other insect pests. These Asi Asiatic garden beetle infestations are not that predictable. So that's another reason why you're waste you potentially are wasting a, a spray. We have seen some success with this tactic, but it's very risky and it may not be worth it in the end. We are looking at different ant at plant products at different rates. Um, typically, the higher rates, we see a little bit better results on Asiatic garden beetle. We have seen promising results, um, and we're determining the baseline toxicity to some of the organophosphate soil insecticides. These have been lab studies um, through uh, uh, the lab of Kelly Tillman, who is our other extension entomologist. And we see some promising results, um, but we really haven't done any field trial tests yet, because especially in the past couple of years, it's been a little bit difficult. The other way to manage it is plant late. If you are planting late, that uh, usually um, uh, is a way to decrease the risk of damage from Asiatic garden beetle. And this is because the grubs will hatch out, will not hatch out, will awake from overwintering, uh, usually in the last week of April, first week of May. And if there's no corn in the field, they'll find something else or they'll just die eventually. But if you've got corn planted the first or second week of May, it's at the perfect growth stage where it's gonna be vulnerable to Asiatic garden beetle. Let's switch gears a bit and talk about the above ground corn, uh, corn pests. One of the major ones we're still dealing with is Western bean cutworm. This was first found in 20, 2006 in Ohio. Um, we've been trapping using adult traps ever since. Our population seemed to have peaked in 2016, but we have seen low populations in the, in the past few years. And 2020 was some of our lowest trapping we've ever done. Uh, this is the result of the trapping that was performed by a lot of our extension educators in, in, in counties across of Ohio. So we're very grateful for the effort that they've all put into this. But this will likely still be a continuing issue. Uh, to do adult monitoring, and this is something we would recommend for individual fields, Female oviposition is a key step for whether or not you're going to get western bean cutworm infestations. The adults emerge in late June and the peak flight is usually around the third to fourth week of July. A lot of this is dependent on the weather. So a warmer summer, a warmer spring will give you an earlier peak, but it's usually uh, between the third and fourth week of July. We like to use these pheromone traps, these green bucket traps here. We use these pheromone lures, which are really cheap. I think they're about a bucket piece and they can last you about a month. Uh, you, they're like rubber pencil cap erasers. You put them in this cage here and hang this trap near the edge of the field. Um, or you know, sometimes I've even recommended to hang it near uh, a mailbox. Uh, they will bring in the moss. If you're, it doesn't necessarily need to be, have to be on the edge of the field, but put it somewhere where you're, you're going to be able to check it regularly. Maybe not every day, but certainly once a week, maybe every other day, just to watch out for the how much moths you're catching. 
but you need to check them at least weekly. Western bean cutworm moths um, look like this. There are three identifying characteristics. One is a leading white stripe on the uh, edge of the wing. Uh, another one is this white circle with a brown dot in it. And then another one is like this um, uh, boomerang shape here, or this comma shape here, the brown. The more often you check, the more likely you're going to be able to see these characteristics. Uh, these are um, scales which rub off. So if you have a lot of insects in here and you don't check it a lot, they could be moving around, they could be rubbing up against other insects and the uh, scales fall off and the color falls off. So it makes it more difficult to accurately identify a western bean cutworm. The pheromones are pretty, speci pretty specific, but sometimes you, you will get other moth species in these traps. Traps are not a good indicator for spraying. I can't give you any thresholds based on how many moths you catch in a trap. Uh, because it's still a little bit unpredictable on that. What traps do are give you an indication on when you should scout your field for egg masses. All of our thresholds are based on uh, the number of egg masses and the percent of corn with a western bean cutworm egg mass. So when greater than one moth per day is caught or greater than seven per week, we should be in our field uh, and scouting for the presence of egg masses. These eggs are laid from July until August in clumps of 25 to 100, and usually they're there for about five to seven days. Warmer temperatures cause a faster hatching, um, or cooler temperatures, you can go up to seven to eight days. The eggs start out a white color here, then they turn kind of a tan, tan, tan and pink color, and then they turn like this purple color. And once they turn purple, they're gonna hatch within 24 hours or so. And so the purple, um, if you need an insecticide application, you want to try to wait, making sure that the larvae are going to emerge. So if you find egg masses that are white, try to mark that corn plant and just get an idea of when they start to turn purple. And then I'll really help you target when you need the spray, if you need the spray. Uh, the eggs can be confused with stink bug eggs. Western bean cutworm are more kind of barrel shaped, more like a, even like a, a, a melon shape. And they have these vertical lines going down. Um, whereas stink bug eggs are more barrel shaped and they have this kind of circle crown of thorns on here, but you can see the colors are somewhat uh, similar. So it's, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to distinguish between a stink bug egg and a Western Maine cutworm egg. Uh, if you use a hand lens, you can really see a zoom up the sort of circle of hairs at the top of a stink bug egg and then the more kind of um, melon shaped uh, Western Maine cutworm eggs. When, so again, um, high risk areas should begin scouting the week, the first or second week of July. And you need to focus on pre-tassel corn. That's uh, a really good preference for females to lay eggs. And the reason is because they wanna time the egg hatch of when the tassels emerge and start to put pollen all over the, 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 uh, the leaves, because that's a good food source for the young emerging larvae. They'll feed on that pollen before they are old enough and they go to the silks and then enter the ear. So you wanna look for pre-tassel corn and the first one or two corn leaves that are in the vertical position, the closest to the tassel. So if you can see here, there's a corn plant and maybe you can spot the egg mass which is right here. This little white spot here is a Western bean cutworm egg mass, probably a clump of around 50 or so. You can see this corn leaf is uh, almost pre-tassel or somewhat a little bit past tassel, but it's in a vertical position here and it's laid on the upper side of the leaf. Sometimes it's good to just walk the row of corn and use the shadow method. So on a sunny day, if you're looking through the bottom part of the leaf, um, you can see a shadow, turn that leaf over and you might see a Western bean cutworm egg mass. So here's another example you can see here, you're looking at the bottom side of the leaf here, and then on the other side, you can see uh, the Western bean cutworm egg masses, which are causing the shadows. A threshold for Western bean cutworm uh, is based on inspection of 10 plants at 10 locations. Check uh, again, pre-tassel corn, and even in the replant areas, if you need to do replant, and if corn's a little bit younger in that area of the field, Five to eight percent have egg mass. I, typically, we tend to err on the on the lower side because we have seen a lot of damage. So five percent with an egg mass treatment is necessary. So if you only see, you know, five corn plants out of a hundred that have an egg mass, 
you're more than likely going to be in a threshold situation. There are many chemicals that are available um, that can control a West Indian cutworm, but timing is critical because you need to spray after the egg hatch, but before the larvae enter the ear. Once they enter the ear, it's going to be very difficult uh, to have the insecticide um, uh, contact them uh, and to cause that damage. That's why the purpling egg, uh, mat, purpling color is a really char key characteristic of when to time your sprays uh, well. One other pest that we've seen a lot of is corn earworm. Uh, and this is just recent in the past few years. I've been with Ohio State for 13 years almost. And it's just within the past two or three years, I've been getting more and more calls about corn earworm. This is um, more typical a pest of sweet corn because of the way they plant and they have almost you know, um, staggered planting dates of, of, of corn. But we have seen more issues in field corn on corn earworm. Here's an example of some trap data. These are adult traps from uh, Celeste Welty, a colleague in, in entomology here at Ohio State. And you can see here 2018 uh, was a relatively high year in terms of adult catches. What's interesting about corn earworm is they can come in very different colors. We refer to these as the Skittles of caterpillars because uh, they have, we can taste the rainbow, so to speak. Again, it's a growing issue in sweet corn and it's emerging in field corn. We've seen more and more issues with this. It's an ear feeder, just like a Western bean cutworm. It doesn't overwinter here. It migrates from the Southern US. So a lot of times we can see them associated with storm fronts, uh, or the remnants of hurricanes, tropical storms that are coming up from the Gulf and entering the Ohio Valley. So it, this is corn era management is really difficult in uh, corn, sweet corn and field corn. Silking is the critical time. The moths are attracted to the silk for egg laying. And here you can see the tiny little eggs that are present on the silk. So this is very, very difficult to inspect, very, very difficult to control. For sweet corn, they use a spray schedule where they can spray almost every three, four, five days, depending on when the fat, fresh silk begins to show and if the moths are active. So in field corn, it's a lot more difficult. Um, silking is still the critical time, but it's more critical to trap for the moth activity in your area. Because if you see a high moth activity in your area, uh, you might get some damage from a uh, corn earworm. Uh, so this is why we recommend some traps. It's very similar to Western mean cutworm trapping with pheromones, uh, and it's something that we would recommend. We are going to start expanding our trapping network for corn earworm, like we do for Western mean cutworm, to get a better idea of what uh, the uh, population is in Ohio. So there's been some issues with BT resistance uh, and transgenics. Um, we talked about it for the below ground for Western corn rootworm, but there's a lot more issues of above ground too for caterpillar species. Um, so for Western bean and corn earworm, only varieties with VIP3A, this is the Agrisure Viptera variety, will control. And in fact, now that corn earworm is resistant to some BTs, this may be a reason why we're starting to see more corn earworm in our field corn that at once or before was protected by using the BTs. Here's an example of field corn from, in Ontario from uh, Jocelyn Smith, from University of Guelph, that's shown a lot of feeding damage um, by a Western bean cutworm, and uh, then kind of the potential for fungal pathogens um, at, in, in association with this feeding. These are BT strip tests. These are purchased commercially, and you just grind up a little piece of a corn leaf, um, and you add some buffer to it, and you put this into a little tube here. This is all provided in the kit. And this is a way to test and see if a corn plant is actually expressing a BT protein. A lot of our corn varieties now are grown with a refuge in a bag. So if you see a corn ear with a lot of damage, it very well could be a refuge ear. It could not be expressing BT, which could explain why you see a lot of damage. So it's recommended to do some of these tests. Here's a test that we did in the lab. Each tube, each stick represents a different corn plant that we sampled that had a lot of feeding from corn earworm. Two lines means that it's positive. In this case, you can see here it's cry one AB. So we had one, two, three, four, five different plants with extensive damage of corn earworm that were expressing this trait that was supposed to control corn earworm. So starting to see more instances of resistance to BT. What's curious is in the past two years, we've seen resistance in European corn borer. 
Um, but this is in an isolated scenario in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, and it's with Cry1F. We haven't seen issues with Ohio. I don't know if it's here or not. I don't think it is, but it is something we're gonna have to monitor in the future. Um, so here, if you're not aware of the Canadian geography, here's the state of Maine and here's Nova Scotia and uh, the maritime, uh, the province and the maritimes. Um, and it's a, on a little peninsula and these fields here in this little bay is where they collected um, uh, European corn borer that were resistant to Cry1F. Um, and here was a, um, a similar field here too. Um, we don't know if it's how far it's spread. We don't know if it's in other parts of Canada, but again, it's something we need to monitor. I don't think we see any resistance in European corn borer in Ohio. So I think those traits are still safe. Uh, so that's good news, but it's something we'll need to monitor. What's also worrisome is that the VIP3A, the Viptera trait, naturally doesn't work against European corn borer. So really one of the only things we have left to control European corn borer are the other cries, the Cry1A and the Cry2s. Um, and again, Cry1F still works um, as far as we know. And so this may or may not become a concern for a how. So I wanna briefly go over some of the highlights uh, for the proposal that the EPA released back in August of, of 2020. Um, one of the things that they wanna do is redefine caterpillar resistance previously to determine if a species was resistant to Bt, we had to do lab confirmation, we had to collect from the field, we had to rear those out to adults, we had to do this multiple generations and to show that resistance was inherited from generation to generation. It's very difficult to do, very time consuming and impossible for certain species like Western bean cutworm. We've tried, many labs have tried, we cannot have grow that in a colony in the lab. There's something about Western bean cutworm that just will not do that. So therefore we cannot, we, we can never define Western bean cutworm as resistant because we can't breed it in the lab. So they wanna change the definition to look at a term that they're calling unexpected injury or unexpected damage is UXD or UXI. And if we see that in the field, that's de defined as practical resistance at the start. So for example, if we're in a field and we have Cry1F being um, expressed in that field and we've checked that with BT strips and we see a lot of damage on Cry1F and we find Western bean cutworm feeding on that, then we can say that practical resistance or Western bean cutworm is practically resistant to, to Cry1F. And we've already seen that in the field. We've already documented that Western bean cutworm is practically resistant to Cry1F. All non-high non dose um, events are at, or pests are at heightened risks of resistance. This means that if a trader is released and not originally targeted for a sp specific pest, then that pest is at a heightened risk of resistance. Another proposal by EPA is they wanna phase out some hybrids specifically hybrids that express only one gene, the single gene. So this is the old Herculex one, the old yield guard corn borer that really only has one gene in it. Um, and they wanna phase that out because you know, it's easier to become resistant to a corn plant that has one gene rather than two genes. And these traits have been in our environment for the past 20, 25 years or so since BT was first released. They also want to phase out some non-functional pyramids. So these are pyramids where you have resistance to one or two or one or two or more BT proteins. But in essence, what they're asking for is any corn that doesn't have VIP or VIP in it should be phased out. And that's very difficult to do because there's only one company that has VIP and that's Syngenta, although they've licensed it to the other companies. The other issue is that it's very hard to get corn plants with VIP especially in northern latitudes because the maturity levels um, are not, the, 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 the market is just not there yet. They've been targeting VIP corn for the south because of corn earworm. So it's very hard to find varieties that are suitable uh, for growing corn uh, with VIP in, in Ohio. They also wanna increase their refuge and seed blends from five to 10%. Extension entomologists don't think this is a good idea because we actually think that this may accelerate or increase the risk of caterpillar resistance to VIP. This slide is from Pat Porter at Texas A&M. And this is just a, a mechanism to show that let's, let's imagine that this purple corn was a BT plant. And let's imagine that these, these corn are all from the surrounding refuge. You can see here that when a BT plant mixes with the pollen, mixes um, with a refuge plant, 
if the purple corn was BT and the yellow corn was non-BT, these are not refuge years because you have some kernels that are expressing BT and some kernels that are not. So what a caterpillar can do is feed, feed, feed. I got a purple kernel, stop, feed, 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 feed. It decreases the exposure of the BT protein to insects, which can then, it's sort of like not taking your full, cor full course of antibiotics. You're not giving it that full dose, which could increase the risk of resistance. The final decision date on this EPA proposal is unknown. Like we've said, it, like I've said, it's a proposal, and with the change of administration and everything else going on, I don't know when they're going to make their final decisions. What does this mean for Ohio? We want to promote the stewardship and make sure you know we're lucky in Ohio that we don't have a lot of cases of resistance, and we want to kind of keep it that way. One thing is to think about if you actually need the traits, because way more than you need is never smart. Um, and the other thing to do is to try to rotate the rotate traits as much as you can. Um, rotate varieties, uh, maybe even go off a year of traits if you can. If you don't know what the traits are, you can look at the handy BT trait table. This is put together by Chris Stefanzo at Michigan State and Pat Porter. Uh, if you Google handy BT trait table, you'll see the trade names, you'll see the trait package, you'll see the trait, and you'll see what pests they control for. It's really useful. Plant some non-BT as a learning process. See how well those varieties could work in, in your farm, in your environment, and, and see how difficult it might be to, to manage those. Look at the corn performance trials uh, in, in Ohio State. I've looked at some of the data, and some of the non-BTs, there aren't many of them, but they perform quite well uh, in certain environments compared to the BTs. The advantage of the non-BT plants is that you're not spending a lot of the money for the tech fees. So something to, to kind of maybe experiment with. Which BTs work for Ohio? Right now for rootworm, everything works as far as we know. Um, this is not the case out west, but for Ohio, most everything will know, but I would still recommend to monitor it as much as you can. For European corn borer, again, everything works as far as we know. Cryo-NF resistance so far is only present in Nova Scotia. I don't think it's spread yet, but, and I hope it's not the case. Um, so everything works for European corn borer, although this will need to be monitored. For corn earworm, only traits with VIP work, and the same with Western mean cutworm, only traits with VIP work. So if you have been planting Cry1F to control Western mean cutworm in the past, it may have worked for you a couple of years ago, but you're going to quickly find out um, that it's gonna, it has lost a lot of its efficacy over time. Um, finally, scout for unexpected damage. This is going to be the new threshold for resistance. And consider using these BT strip tests to distinguish between refuge and non-refuge corn. I think this is going to be continuing, con this is going to be important, especially as if you're in a field that has a refuge in a bag, you want to make sure that the damage you see is actually present on a corn plant that's expressing BT. Uh, and here's the BT tra tra traits table. Uh, updated uh, last year. I think they're going to produce another update. And what you want to look for is the trait package here, the BT protein that's in the trait. And then this column here, the entomologist has added this. This is, if, if it passes here, that means resistance has been confirmed to uh, one or more of the BTs in the package. So you need to watch out for that. The other final thing I would suggest is to know your larvae. Um, so here are some of the common caterpillar larvae. We haven't seen a lot of these because BT has been so effective, but we're starting to see a lot more of them. And so I think we need to revisit on, on, in a review of the identification uh, uh, procedures on this. So if you're guessing at home, ECB, European corn borer, that is B here, kind of this nondescript larvae. Western bean cutworm, that is C. You can see here, it's got these two black or brown wide stripes right behind the head. Corn earworm is D, very colorful, has these, lie, these stripes here um, in a dark uh, uh, by the, behind the head. And fall armyworm, which I didn't talk about, sometimes we see it in Ohio, but it's really rare, uh, has this kind of inverted Y shape here. So know your larvae and know what could be potentially feeding on your corn. So in summary, corn rootworm, continue to rotate, it's got continuous, continuous corn for resistance. Asiatic garden beetle, it's difficult to control, watch for sandy soils and consider some soil insecticides. Caterpillars, we mostly see them late in the season. Um, inspect your ears, watch for unexpected damage. So with that, I wanna thank uh, Kelly Tillman, who is our other extension entomologist. I believe she'll be speaking this afternoon about soybean insects. Amy Roddenbush and, um, Amy Roddenbush and Adrian Pekarczyk are uh, Kelly's technician and grad student that have done a lot of work in Asia Carnaby. And the Cindy Wallace is my technician helping me out with some of the traps and everything. 
So with that, maybe there's time for a couple questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. We do have a couple questions for you before lunchtime. And um, I see Pierce is still working on answering a lot of questions. So thank you, Pierce, for um, doing that. There's a lot of good questions in there. So um, you can see the answers to Pierce's questions. As so Mary, I see two questions that are insect related. Yeah. Um, so maybe I can get these really quickly because the answers are, are pretty quick. Does a cover crop help with rootworm corn after corn? Uh, it only would help if you're not planting corn in that field of cover crop. Um, so if you have corn, plant a cover crop and you plant corn back in there, it's not gonna do anything for rootworm. It's really not gonna help. There might be some better management with protecting some biocontrol mechanisms like uh, nematodes when you can encourage that. Um, but if you have a really high pressure field, you know, corn after corn, even if you've put a cover crop in there, the, the reason that is because the females are laying eggs. And so those eggs are laid in July or so, and they're eggs the whole time until Memorial Day weekend. And so when the, if a cover crop is in there, that cover crop is gonna be gone and dead by the time those larvae hatch. So the best that it could do is increase some biologicals in the field, and that's always a good scenario. I'm not gonna say don't do cover crops because it certainly benefits the cover crops, but for specific control of rootworms, that might be a little bit difficult to do. Um, the high rate of seed treatment for insecticides, I believe it's still 1250, um, but uh, uh, check uh, the, the bags and check the trade tables, but I believe still it's 1250. There are some new seed treatments available. This is based on not neonic, but um, the diamides. I think Lamivia is one of them. So you might wanna look into that too. We've seen the same success with uh, the non neonics and we have the neonics. And I think there's one more, any trait differences or insecticide differences in controlling stink bug ear damage in corn. The BTs will not control stink damage or stink bug damage. The BTs are only specific for lepidopterans, the caterpillars and beetles. Um, so they won't control stink bug damage. We haven't seen any issues with insecticide resistance yet. Um, we're doing this in soybean. We've done a little bit of this last year and we're doing more this year. We haven't seen any issues with resistance to stink bugs in, uh, uh, in, for insecticides in corn or soybeans. So anything that, you, that is labeled for stink bug control should give you the efficacy that you need. All right, thank you so much, Andy. It looks like that's it for our questions right now. Um, and Pierce is still typing answers to these <laughs> questions. Thanks a lot, Andy. Um, so I'm going to show up 